So as a scientist, you are now happy that you have reached the last step of the scientific method. And this is perhaps a crucial step that many people forget, but it's definitely one of the most important. Just like I was important for you to start with asking a question and start right, it's also important to finish right, finish strong. And that's when you share what you've learned from your studies with your peers. That is important, and it's done in several different ways. Uh, normal uh, modern technology has changed this a lot too, but normally scientists will go to meetings and conferences and do presentations where they talk to their colleagues about the results. And they will also present these results in journals, uh, scientific journals. They're called peer-reviewed reviewed journals because what the scientist has to do, he has to write a paper, basically a lab report, and submit this paper to a, a, a review committee, which then analyzes the paper, see if it's good, and then sends it back with comments, and then he sends it back to them, and if approved, and then it's put in a research journal. Uh, news, news departments also sometimes uh, talk about uh, what happens. For example, Nature is uh, kind of like both. It's a magazine that, that posts uh, journals, articles, and also talks about news and science. And it also does other media publications, including audio and video, uh, not especially nowadays, where we have the internet, we have phone calls, we have texting, emailing, and social networking. It has changed the way that scientists communicate what they have learned in society. Uh, very important, though, to communicate correctly. Uh, one of the biggest problems that happens in science sometimes is that the, need, the media picks up the discoveries that scientists do, and then they misinterpret what the scientist has said. And this is very tricky because when you look at the original article that a scientist published, you will find that he never really said what the media is saying. It's like the media got the results of the experiment and they blew it up out of the proportion, and they drew conclusions from it that were not the conclusions that the scientists drew. So that just comes to show you that it's very important to be careful about where you get your information from because if it's not, look at the original source article, the person who actually did the experiment and what she said, because sometimes the media uh, misrepresents what they were talking about. For example, recently, at the time this video was recorded, a scientist had actually gotten a silicon device, basically, almost like a, the shape of a medusa, you know, the, those things that swim in the, in the ocean. And he put cardiac cells from, you know, uh, heart tissue and in a certain pattern throughout the silicon. And then with an electrical impulse generated, he, he made it so that the heart cells acted like a muscle that would move the silicon structure around. And in all intents and purposes, they created a kind of like a cyborg-like being, but not really. It's not alive. It doesn't characterize the characteristics of life. It can't replicate. It can look for it. it's, its own energy. Uh, it's just kind of like an engine powered by living cells but it's not really alive but the news picked that up and blew it up in proportion and said that the first uh, cybernetic uh, cyborg like uh, life form had been done and and so you see how uh, it's dangerous to 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 consume science directly from the news from the media or from social networking uh, it's important to look at the what the scientists are originally saying and to grow up to be someone who can actually read and understand that so that you can follow what they're saying and see just like real scientists do what they did right and what they did wrong which takes me to the next part of of science which is scientists do this with a reason because they have to engage in this last step into something that's called peer review and that's when other scientists verify the data the procedures and the conclusions and the analysis that the scientists did on their study so what they're trying to do here is, is figure out if the, this scientific method was followed when this research was done. And then they're also going to be criticizing and analyzing the work of each other to make sure that the knowledge that's being added to science is good knowledge. And that's why the scientific knowledge is so strong, it's so robust, because you can trust it because you know that a large group of people are constantly working with each other and against each other to make sure that their data and their methods and their analysis and their conclusions all make sense. And then they also expect people to go back and redo what a scientist has done. When a first time somebody does something new, nobody accepts it until somebody else can replicate it. Recently, somebody managed to, to, to accelerate a neutrino faster than the speed of light. 
And at the time this video was being recorded, it was still up in the air if this was actually the first time that the light speed barrier was broken by something that has mass. And this is a crazy implications if it actually did happen. But until somebody goes in there and replicates that, and maybe even expands the results, it, you can't really uh, say that this is being added to or, or changing science. So basically, replication and exploration of the results uh, makes sure that people from different labs or different scientists altogether can do the same thing you did, which is again and why it's so important to, to, to write exactly what you did when you do a lab report because we, it needs to be replicable. So people can draw the same conclusions you draw by doing the same thing you've done to make sure that it's not something about you that made that possible. And so it takes a lot to change science because you're going to have to prove that your methods were good, that your data was well collected, that your procedures were good, that you analyzed things correctly, and that your conclusions were well drawn. You're going to have to survive the criticism and analysis of many other scientists. You're going to have to have, wait until that, those results are replicated. And then, only then, that people are going to start looking at that discovery and expand on that discovery and incorporate that discovery into the knowledge of science. But science does allow that to happen. And actually, this is all essential to the process of change that science has had. You know, this process allows scientists to build upon the work of others. Imagine spending years working on something that are, someone already worked on and you're wasting time because this has already been uh, established, basically. Now, of course, it's not really a waste of time because you're double-checking their work. But if you thought all along that you were doing something new, just because somebody never published it, it'll be kind of sad when you finally come out with it and you find out, oh, somebody already did this. You know? Well, at least you contributed to, to replicating and finding the results. For example, when Darwin first came out with the theory of evolution, another scientist called Wallace independently came up with the same thing. And so... In a way, for Wallace, it was like, ah, man, a little bit too late. But in another way, it's actually cool because then two people are saying the same thing about the same phenomena. It makes the scientific knowledge stronger. Uh, but either way, when you're doing science, you're starting from what is known. When you do the background, you're going back to the research on what people have told you. But if the, those people have withheld their knowledge, that would deprive you of what you could have known to start with. And that will slow down science. So sharing information is essential for science to grow, to improve the scientific field. And because humanity, technology, improves because of science, ultimately you're also contributing to the applications and to the technology that's going to come to change society because of that. So this procedure ensures that science is always evolving, both as a method and as a body of knowledge, to allow science to be what it really is, which is a strong a uh, group of, of, of people working together to, to change things, to question things. And that's why it's also very important to do science ethically. You should report everything that you find out. It's very common in practical science that sometimes people discover that their hypothesis was not, uh, you know, it was rejected. The data did not support their hypothesis. And then it's very tempting to not write about that and to not tell people about that. And in other words, you ignore the bad results and you only publish when you find something. That's very dangerous though. Because like I said before, you've learned just enough with a bad hypothesis than you learn with a good one. You learn that that's not the rate of doing it. If you table that, if you hide that, what you're doing is that you're wasting people's time because people wouldn't have tried that or wasted time redoing what you've already did to figure out it didn't work. But scientists do that sometimes because they're being unethical because they're so adamant about their beliefs or, you see, that's the whole subjectivity thing. Uh, you try to be objective, but sometimes the scientist wants his theory to be right so bad that when he does an experiment that contrasts his theory, he prefers to hide the result than to tell people. A true scientist does not do that. He will be able to live with the facts and accept what is right and what's not and tell others if he finds out that his theory was incorrect. Einstein came up with the theory of relativity and a few years later Hubble came up with the idea that the universe was expanding faster and faster which challenged a part of Einstein's relativity theory and he spent the rest of his life trying to reconciliate his theory with that new finding but instead of bashing Hubble for, for 
he actually had to change his theory based on the new data that was incorporated. It, it's important for science to present all results, not just the results which are commensurate or which are the ones that they want to talk about. Because you can learn from failure just as much as you can learn from success. And likewise, you should never temper with data. Because, for example, recently the uh, global warming debate became very heated, uh, no pun intended, when it was discovered that one of the scientists that originally did the work to show that the, the world was warming up had actually intentionally falsified and fabricated data. When you do that, obviously you make people uh, question the validity of that uh, information and question whether or not I can trust the science in general. You know, and that's the problem if you're going to be unethical when you're doing the scientific research. So communication is very important. Scientists share with peers in a variety of ways. They present, they do journals, they through the media, through social networking. And they do that so that science can grow as a whole in a process where scientists talk to each other and do what is called peer review. And they verify each other's procedures, their data, their analysis, their conclusions. They criticize each other. They replicate each other's work. They expand on each other's work. All of which so that they can build on the science as a whole. And in, as a consequence, add improvements to society. And ensure that science continues to grow. Both as a method of study and as a body of knowledge. That is why it's so important to communicate your results in an ethical way. Without hiding anything. And without tempering with the data.